Few things can withstand the crushing pressure of ton upon ton of ice. People stand on the bridges to watch the show, but they don't stay there long. Now the ice-choked river has new ammunition. Debris from the first bridge to help weaken the structure of the second and transform it into twisted wreckage. A car caught in the span goes hurtling down. A third bridge lies ahead, biggest and strongest of the lot. The load thrust against it grows heavier and heavier. Melting ice and snow and weeks of torrential rain bring the greatest hazard of all, flood. An avalanche of water thunders downward. Levees are blasted to change its course, but to no avail. Outlying farms, houses, and stores are first to be gobbled up. A riverside factory dependent upon water power gets enough water power to put it out of commission. Congested areas are reached, and soon whole blocks are doing a disappearing act into the mud and slime-filled waters. All of man's ingenuity cannot stop this now. The flood must run its course, leaving in its wake miles of ruin. For the disaster fighters, the job is saving lives. Victims of the deluge are picked up with surprising calm. Pets are also on the rescue list, and from their miniature Noah's Ark, they look mighty grateful. The current grows more and more ugly. This flood has become a raging killer, capable of sweeping to doom any living thing in its path. For one youth, a tree trunk provides a precarious refuge. With a current too strong for boats, ropes are used. Along one rope, a survivor is carried to safety. Out in those dark and swirling waters, so near and yet so far from rescue, a man and a woman are trapped on top of a car. Disaster fighters work desperately to reach them in these on-the-spot films, among the most dramatic ever photographed. But in this life-or-death battle, death wins. The car and its human burden are swept away to destruction. Here's an airplane view of the Ohio River flood as it pours through outlying sections of Cincinnati and neighboring cities in Kentucky. More than 20 towns have been inundated and many thousands have been forced to abandon their homes for higher ground along more than half of the river's 1,200 mile course. From the sky, the area about Dayton and Covington presents a regular Venetian panorama. The second flood crest within a week invaded the wholesale business district of Cincinnati, doing enormous damage and bringing traffic to a standstill, except for rowboats. Bridges were imperiled as the Ohio rose 12 feet above flood level. Smaller structures were swept away, including the garage you see being taken for a ride. But at last reports, it was hoped the worst was over. When the Wright brothers flew their parred craft on December 17, 1903, few people would believe that airplanes would become a practical way to travel. And from these early attempts, you can see why. Poised precariously on a Connecticut bridge, this inventor might become an eagle, but he has a better chance of becoming an angel. His bat wing special, now an awesome moment, as the first rocket plane is fueled for a precedent-shattering flight. 
an asbestos-clad scientist lights the fuse, then runs for cover. There's no telling how far this revolutionary rocket ship may travel, perhaps into outer space, perhaps to the very moon. With the first rocket mail years later, science marches on. Vast improvements have been made on the early primitive rocket, and now... That's what happened to the letter you've been expecting. In Toledo, an inventive genius gets all juiced up to prove the hard way that every man can be his own rocket ship. And away we go. Rocket schmocket. Sam, you made the pants too hot. Smile for the wood, she's running wild. A pilot could easily lose his head if he ran in the wrong direction. Early helicopters were dangerous. Careful, men. Watch out for tricks. In Detroit, the first umbrella helicopter makes its bow. As light as lead and cast iron could make her, this undergrown carousel was supposed to jump into the air. Try this on your next hangover. Back in France, there appeared a new kind of copter driven by a pair of oversized pinwheels. This aerial bucking Bronco had the stability of an intoxicated chorus girl and required a ground crew skilled in the 100-yard dash. A gas bag and a pilot were added for control. Hmm, some control. Just let her loose and where she goes, nobody knows. They called her the Flying Sausage, but to that perspiring ground crew, she was just a lot of baloney. This is how they got air sick back in 1921. Featuring the upsweep wing, this sturdy plane was designed for intercontinental flight. With luck, it might get across the street. Here is the short, short story of the Seagull plane, which in the realm of flight was just successful enough to be a crashing failure. Germany, Otto Lilienthal bets on a sure thing by imitating the flight of birds, even the flapping wings and feathers. But when the swallows come back to Capistrano, Otto won't be along. Up in Maine, the wooden eagle is unveiled to a waiting world. Those who came to ridicule remain to watch in amazement as it flies to pieces. These were but minor setbacks in our attempt to conquer the sky. With plane travel becoming increasingly popular, far greater tragedies were about to occur. One of the most famous of these events happened at the Empire State Building on July 28, 1948, at 9.45 in the morning. A B-25 bomber flying a routine mission in dense fog hit the then tallest structure in the world. It struck between the 78th and 79th floors, killing all three airmen on board and several people inside the building. The tragedy could have been much worse if it weren't for the fact that the plane hit on a Saturday with 90% of the tenants away from their offices. Airplanes weren't the only area of aviation that encountered serious problems. Crafts lighter than the air, dirigibles, were soon featured in the news in a far from favorable light. By the mid-30s, the blimp was capable of some astonishing tricks of its own. Hovering directly over the world's tallest building, this airship picks up the afternoon mail. the Empire State behind, it's a trip out to sea for a special delivery to an ocean liner. Careful, mailman, that smokestack's not a mail slot. Now let's turn from the blimp to the biggest of lighter-than-air craft, the rigid airship, or Zeppelin. Used by Germany in World War I, some were shot down, but others got through to rain bombs on London. 
At war's end, France acquired the German-built Dixmude. Its complete disappearance with all hands remains a great unsolved mystery. In 1919, Britain, busily engaged on an extensive dirigible production program, unveiled her R-29. Nothing has ever approached the streamlined skinniness of this snake of the skies. The British R-33 suffered a broken nose in a runaway flight over the North Sea, but was brought home safely. The R-38, built by England for America, broke in half on a test flight, plunging into the river Humber and killing 45 of her crew. From Italy, the U.S. Navy purchased the Roma, a semi-rigid airship with a collapsible gas bag, but a solid keel attached beneath. In 1922, the Roma took off on a flight that was to be her last. Moments later, after plummeting to the earth and exploding, she lies below a smoking ruin. First American-built Zeppelin was the Shenandoah, Daughter of the Stars. The wreckage of this $2 million ship dots the Ohio countryside after a sudden squall tore her apart in midair. 14 were killed, 27 miraculously escaped. In this glistening airship, man's fondest dreams of lighter-than-air travel seem to have come true. She could be used as an aircraft carrier, with planes like tiny gnats hooking on and dropping from trapeze arrangements attached to her great underbelly. seemed marked for disaster from the beginning. In 1932, while she was attempting to moor, a gust of wind swept her skyward so suddenly that three men of her ground crew were pulled high into the air. The grip of one man loosened, and he fell to his death. The second man followed him to destruction. But the third crewman hung on and was saved. Shortly afterward, the Akron passed above New York City, seeming to glide over the tops of the buildings below. She was only 17 months old when, with a crew of 76 aboard, she moved out to sea to her doom in a storm. Bits of wreckage marked her resting place. Her sister ship, the Macon, already under construction when the Akron was lost, followed her into service. Mooring an airship as big as a skyscraper tipped on its side was a ticklish job. The Macon hadn't yet reached her second birthday when she journeyed out to Point Sur, California to maneuver with the fleet in the Pacific. Here she settled into the sea, and of the proud Macon, soon only an oil slick remained. In 1937, the Hindenburg, a flying luxury liner with observation decks and lounge rooms for her passengers, began her second year of regular transatlantic service. Because of Germany's lack of helium, the Hindenburg was filled with explosive hydrogen. Coming in for a landing at Lakehurst, New Jersey, with 97 aboard, the Hindenburg dropped her lines. Everything seemed in perfect order, when suddenly... death of the Hindenburg, the majestic queens of the sky were seen no more floating in beauty above the earth. And so it ended, the fabulous era of lighter than air. The machine gun. Tight. The airplane. Is this the end of the rifleman? The damage to military equipment, like trucks, weapons, comes mostly from being dragged or rolled over the ground. Armored vehicles, because of their greater weight, are more resistant to the shock waves. 
human beings also are very resistant to direct effects of the blast. It takes a far greater shock to injure you than to knock down these buildings. Most casualties from the blast are caused by its indirect effects. Men get hurt by flying bricks, glass, limbs of trees, rocks, or by buildings falling in on them. Of course, if you are standing in the open, you can be ducked and hurled through the air until you come to a sudden casualty-producing stop. From the instant of that first blast until Hiroshima vanished from the list of living cities, closely guarded plants in New Mexico, Tennessee, and the state of Washington continued their work to shorten the war. Hiroshima, one of Japan's arsenal cities, was selected as the first to feel the weight of atomic power. 21 days after the New Mexico dress rehearsal, a lone B-29 was over Hiroshima carrying an atomic bomb. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6, Japanese time, the first atomic bomb hit an enemy target. The bomb was aimed to explode above zero point, a spot in the city at the junction of the Motoyiso and Ota rivers. The bomb was intentionally set to explode well above the zero point to dissipate its radioactivity. Here is the pictorial record of the result. At zero point, directly beneath the explosion, the soldier in the scene is pointing at the spot from which all damage to the surrounding area was measured in terms of distance from the center of the blast. Within a mile of zero point, the devastation speaks for itself. But in these very ruins, army cameramen have found and filmed pictorial evidence that tells in twisted steel and stone the effect of death-dealing atomic power. For example, this was the site of the main Japanese military headquarters. There were approximately 20,000 Japanese military personnel stationed here. They are among the missing. A lone concrete smokestack indicates where a bustling factory once stood. Reinforced concrete buildings seem to have withstood the explosion fairly well, the damage varying with their distance from zero point. Within an area of a mile to a mile and a half, this type of building was the only type to withstand complete demolition and destruction. Here's a building that was knocked sidewise, giving you an idea of the force of the blast. The direction of the blast is graphically told by the slant of this parapet, a concrete wall. Etched in the stone base of what was the Russo-Japanese War Memorial are telltale lines. Atomic handwriting for all to read. Another signpost of the direction and force of the explosion is blasted in the polished granite base of this statue. The light surface indicates the angle of the blast, two-tenths of a mile from zero point. Many of the shattered windows pointed like skeleton fingers the direction of the atomic wind of death. On one side, blown in. On the other, blown out with atomic tornado force. Inside, the flash burns on the chairs give eloquent testimony on the heat of the blast a mile from zero point, which singed the mohair upholstery like a blowtorch. Hiroshima City Hall, which stood at an angle of 45 degrees to the direction of the explosion, had its doors and windows blown in, but suffered much less damage than buildings squarely in the path of the blast. The windows and doors offer mute evidence of the way the blast swept into the structures. The destructive circle within a mile from zero point had a few notable exceptions, mainly reinforced concrete. On the edge of the area of greatest damage was a landmark, the Red Cross Hospital, which never ceased functioning, although it sustained damage. Today, it dominates the desert of a debris that was Hiroshima. Another notable exception to the general demolition was the Higaski Railroad Station in East Hiroshima, a mile and a half from the center of the blast. This building, however, suffered extensive damage. 
The twisted steel beams and concrete walls show the effects of the tremendous concussion. What's left of the commercial museum? Within two-tenths of a mile of zero point also gives indication of the tremendous push of the explosion. The downward force of the blast turned the roof of the commercial museum into a reservoir. Amazingly enough, bridges did not suffer too badly at Hiroshima. This steel rail bridge, one mile from zero point, had the side toward the explosion virtually blasted by flying particles, which removed almost all the paint. But the side away from the explosion did not need a new paint job. Roads in the area fared better than buildings or bridges. Shortly after the fires died down, traffic was resumed. Today, these highways through the ruins are again in use. Beside our military traffic trudge the survivors of vanished Hiroshima, the first city in history to be atom bombed into oblivion. Even four miles away, the effects of the atomic blast were felt. Although a hill between the novitiate of the Jesuits and zero point lessened the intensity, windows of the main building were shattered. A group of priests witnessed and survived the Hiroshima blast. One of them, Father John Zymus, tells what he actually saw. An eyewitness account. I was in my room, which faces the valley, and suddenly I saw a light, like magnesium light, flashlight, which uh, filled the whole valley, and looking out of my window to find out the reason for this peculiar phenomena, I saw nothing besides this light, and turning uh, from the window to the door of my room, I heard a crash, it may, be, may have been 10 seconds uh, after seeing the light, the flashlight, and immediately I was covered with splinters of the window frames and glass sticking uh, into the walls and actually in my flesh itself. Uh, after a while we saw a procession of people coming from the outskirts of the city up the valley. Uh, many of them, most of them, were wounded uh, especially the parts of the body which were not covered by uh, clothes, like hands, feet, uh, back. All of us who lived uh, through this exper experience at the spot estimate the numbers of deaths at least at 100,000. A B-29 set out for Nagasaki. Instructions were precise. To the north, Japan's greatest torpedo plant. To the south, steel and arms works were located in the heart of the city. The bomb was aimed midway between the two plants to cause greatest possible damage. Because the plants were located in a valley, surrounding hills shielded most residential areas and concentrated the damage on the industrial section. At 10.58, the morning of August 9th, the bomb was exploded above the city and in the towering mushroom, Japan could read its doom. This was more than a routine bombing. It was the funeral pyre of an aggressor nation. The bomb had been purposely exploded high so that the greatest part of its radioactive material was dissipated in the stratosphere. From the air, the skeletons of the Mitsubishi plants made evident that Nagasaki's war-making power was totally destroyed. For the valley area of little more than three square miles, blast and fire reduced the industrial plants and surrounding buildings to blackened rubble. The Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works extended almost a mile in length. Before the blast, these were modern buildings constructed like our own American factories. Closer examination of the ruins shows the same complete destruction that characterized the ruins of Hiroshima. Damage to equipment and machinery used in the manufacture of naval rifles, AA guns and heavy artillery was such that even if Japan had determined to commit suicide by continuing resistance, she could not have salvaged much from the ruins. Smokestacks bent but did not break before the blast. And roads were unaffected. 
people using them without ill effect shortly after the explosion. The ruins revealed beyond doubt the existence of the shadow factories the Japanese had set up in the nearby residential areas of the industrial valley. You have seen the swath of destruction created by atomic power in this tale of two cities. The world's greatest minds in science, statecraft, and military matters are wrestling with the problems created by the atom. On this spot, outlined in stone, is a figure representing the average man, regardless of his race or creed. These atomic footprints on the sands of time can never be erased. They point a path which leads to unparalleled progress or unparalleled destruction. Just as in the darkness of the desert morning when the atomic age was born, atomic power puts the question squarely to mankind. <laughs>